feels loud. I, I don't know if that's the monitors. Psalm 91. I'm sure whoever it was that gave Jose Torres that book on the Red Sox <laughs> was just concerned to see him delivered from the evil empire. <laughs> Ted Williams' mom was a Mexican. Just tried to get him over to the good side. Uh, Psalm 91. Uh, this spring, you may have seen it in Time Magazine, there was an article on pastor's wives. And in this article, the uh, statistic was given that the number one reason for pastors leaving the ministry was pastors' wives' issues. So I don't know how that plays out in our fellowship, but in the larger American church world, it is what the pastor's wife is dealing with, what she's going through, that is putting more men out of the ministry than any other thing. And so I think would be naive to think that that, is, that that couldn't happen among us. It says that 80% of pastors' wives wish their husbands had a different career. Now, I, I don't think that in our fellowship we would ever get to that percentage, or we're at that percentage, but that's a pretty staggering statement. And again, would be naive to think that there aren't some pastor's wives who might feel that way. From time to time, you, I know, I've heard it. Uh, so, you know, this man's no longer in the field, and often they'd say, yeah, I think it was mostly his wife. And so I want to talk about a refuge for pastor's wives from this passage of Scripture and uh, to I trust will be an encouragement and a help to women that are feeling the strain of, uh, of pastor wife, pastor's wife responsibility. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor from the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness nor the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. Therefore shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee, up, bear thee up in thy hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, and the young lion and the dragon shall thou trample under feet. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. And I will be with him in trouble, and will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Refuge for the pastor's wife. And I want to think, first of all, with you about the pastor's wife, anxiety. 
we might be able to make the statement, and you could uh, quarrel with me, don't do it now, uh, but that the pastor's wife is more emotionally linked, emotionally linked to how the church is doing than any other person in the church. She is an emotional creature. She's an emotional being, uh, far more, hopefully, <laughs> than her husband. <laughs> and, and so she is going to feel things, and, uh, and her anxieties are going to be triggered far more often and far more deeply sometimes than anybody else in the church. Uh, there are some reasons for this. There are some reasons that a, pastors' wives live with a great deal of anxiety. And I think we have to say that maybe the number one reason for this in most situations is the treatment that she receives from the people in the church. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I feel so much better now? <laughs> In this article, it said that 80% of pastors' wives feel unappreciated and unaccepted by the people in their churches. Uh, it is perhaps true that to many people in the church, the pastor's wife is high enough on the ladder, uh, not high enough on the ladder to be treated with real respect, but high enough on the ladder to be blamed for things. And how this translates out is that a pastor's wife who is making the sacrifices for the ministry is not valued for what she does do, and she's not accepted for who she is. And many times that's because people are measuring her by some standard that is not Come, coming from her husband or from her own pastor, it's coming sometimes from the religious mindset of some people in the church, and I make that emphasis on some. You know, I uh, appreciate what Pastor Torres has said. Uh, you know, the Jezebel spirit is a very wicked thing, and we deal with that and wrestle with that, and as the days come to the coming of the Lord, it's going to be more and more intense but we could also say that there are men in the church that if the wife does even has an opinion she's a Jezebel <laughs> if she does anything she's a Jezebel then the women feel if she doesn't do everything there that's why no revival the pastor's wife is often blamed for the love factor in the church you know when people say there's not enough love in the church that's usually women saying that and it's usually women who have relationship problems. <laughs> the reason they're not having much love because they've alienated everybody in the church from them and they're blaming the pastor's wife for the fact there's no love in the church. You know, it's interesting in the Word of God, you know, the Apostle Paul is dealing with many things, but, you know, the only personal conflict that he seemed to address in terms of two individuals were Iodia and Syntyche in the book of Philippians. He said, Would you two ladies get along, please? Somehow, <laughs> their relationship crisis was affecting the entire church, and they needed to get that right. That's the kind of atmosphere that a pastor's wife lives in. We, women can create problems in the church. And usually the pastor's wife is the one who's going to hear about it from them. She has anxiety about the church. You're thinking about in, in Acts chapter 6, you know, we often 
preach on Acts chapter 6 is the raising up of disciples, you know, because the widows were not being taken care of in the daily administration. And, you know, how did they find out about that? You know, I mean, in your church, it was happening in your church, right? Because the women had started talking and complaining among themselves and getting on the phone or on the internet and uh, telling everybody. And finally, probably after it's been a crisis for you, then, then it finally gets to the pastor. But it's, it's often the kinds of the women who are talking, complaining, uh, you, you know, uh, and where they go to. They, they don't dare go and speak to the pastor. So they'll go to the pastor and say, I don't want to hear about it. Well, okay, I just, and <laughs> they'll just make sure she hears about it as they're walking away. You know, her anxiety about how the church is doing, right? Because the church, how the church is doing is directly affected, to, uh, affects her security, right? A bunch of people leave the church. That's going to affect her uh, livelihood, right? Her income, her, uh, if whether her babies are going to be taken care of. You know what I'm saying? And, and when people leave the church, you know, the pastor might be like, yeah, they're carnal or whatever, you know, and he steals himself. But for a woman, she's, she's a relationship-oriented creature. She feels that as intense rejection. She feels the trauma of the rejection when people leave. And when people accuse on their way out, they often feel it very, very deeply. There's another portion, another reason for the anxieties is because there's a tremendous amount of pressure on the marriage and the children and the finances. You know, the pastor's wife you're either married to somebody who has two jobs, right? He's got a full-time job he's working to support the family, and then he has another full-time job, which is pastoring the church. Very few other women in the church are in that position where their husbands have two full-time jobs. With all the strains and difficulties and pressures that that brings upon him. If he's not working full-time uh, at two jobs, he's probably traveling. He's going overseas. He's, he's away from home a great deal of time. And this leaves her often with the pressures of dealing with family things. And uh, like it or not, when things happen in the church, well, she's got people come and they dump it on her. And so there are pressures. You uh, leave your mother church and go get a job in another city, there's a very good chance that you had some seniority and some uh, favor. Now you're not going to get the same level paying job when you go out. Okay? That's, that's not evil or wrong. That's just reality. So, but she's the one who's got to feed the babies and, and clothe them, and she, she'll feel that financial pressure that's there children changing schools and uh, the adjustments that they're facing in new schools and the adjustment they're facing in a new church and and uh, these are things that for the pastor hey it's just part of doing business uh, suck it up kids and let's go but mom feels it right mom feels what the kids are going through i'm talking about emotion i'm talking about anxieties right i'm talking about the, some of the strains that she feels. See, our text says, You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. This is a psalmist, and I know it is... You know, the, the language has a masculine language. It's he that is being spoken of. But you understand that for many, many years until our recent 
political correctness where we have to not use he anymore. He means she too. Right? That means that this promise, these promises apply to pastors' wives. Right? That you can, there's a place in God where you can deal with the fears and the anxieties that come upon your life. He's there for you. And, and hopefully, if this sermon comes off, God help me, that, uh, that you'll, you'll begin to find that place uh, before uh, too long. I want to look, secondly, at responding to anxiety. Because here's where it comes down, right? It goes... It's understood that a pastor's wife position is one that has a great deal of anxiety attached to it. There's the issue. How are you going to react to that? How are you going to deal with that? Because you can deal with it in, a very, in the natural realm, in a fleshly realm. Uh, when you're anxious about the church, you're anxious about how things are going. You're anxious about people leaving. You're anxious about what's happening with your babies. You're anxious about that. It's very common to then start criticizing your husband <laughs> for, uh, are you sure you should have said that? Are you sure you should have preached on that? <laughs> you know, And she's just, she's, she's freaking out. And so here, you know, your pastor, the pastor needs a fan somewhere, and, uh, and uh, his, his name, main fan, used to have his na her name on the head with a big, you know, one of those foam rubber, one finger up, you know, I'm for you, dear, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, it's just, it's tough when, when you step back into your home because your wife is filled with anxiety about what's happening that she begins to blame, or maybe she's making suggestions, which to a man is the same thing. <laughs> Just write it down. <laughs> you know, when Pastor Campbell preached last uh, conference on David and Michael, you know, here's David comes in. He, it's a victory, right? The, the tabernacle has been established. Uh, he's worshiping God. And he comes home, and there's Michael. And Michael has something she wants to criticize about how he handled the service that night. And Pastor Kimball said, remember, not now, dear. Not now. <laughs> you know, sometimes you say what's on your heart. But you know what? There are just times and you got to give that man some victories. Right? Let him milk the victories. Right? If, if somebody got saved that night, and, and uh, if, if, if so-and-so actually showed up that night, and he's pumped, don't tell him that he sang the whole first chorus wrong. Just, <laughs> right? <laughs> It'll help him if he can enjoy the victories. As Pastor Torres said, you can wind him up about people. That you know that there are people in the church that are speaking against your husband and they're speaking to people about what's wrong. And, and uh, they're not, and those trigger your anxieties. And so you want to wind him up. Say, you should get, kick that out, you know, deal with this. And uh, you got to, it's not your realm, right? It's not your realm. And uh, that's not how you respond to your anxieties. Further, you can take matters into your own hands. Well, if my husband's not going to deal with this, I'm going to deal with it. <laughs> and I'm just telling you, you're, just, you're not equipped. It's not your role. It's not your job. You feel if you just said the right thing, man, you'd fix the thing. But there's a very good chance it's not going to fix you know, when it says, husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, giving honor unto them as unto the weaker vessel, that's talking about there's a fragility of nature, right? You're not equipped to step into that realm, to 
deal with uh, those pressures and those responsibilities. And that's not just, you know, in nursery problems that you don't work that through. And, you know, there's responsibilities and things you have. But in terms of feeling the weight and the pressure of all the anxieties of some of the struggles that are going through in the church, you, you, you have to be careful how you respond. Right? Don't respond with criticism. Right? Don't respond with winding him up against his enemies. Right? Don't react by saying, okay, well, if he's not going to do something about it, I'm going to step in and do. Let's look about what the right response is. The right response has to do with discretion, first of all. What is discretion? Could we say discretion is knowing when you shouldn't say something? Right, there, there's just, here, here's the thing. The Bible says in First Peter that if any, uh, you know, wives submit yourselves to your own husbands and if any obey not the word, they may be, may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. So that's a truth that says, ladies, your words are not your best tools or your best weapons for getting done what you need feel needs to be done if you just live for God if you live for God and some other things I'll say later that's the best defense that's the best tool that you have watch Watch what you say. Watch your mouth. I know you want to talk about it because talking about it is how you get relief. And there are going to be times when that's just what you need to do and your husband will sit and hear you out and pray with you and help you. He needs to be there for you. But you have to understand that some, you cannot always just be expressing Verbal, everything that you're going through and everything that you're feeling, it just, it, there's a place of discretion. There's a place of deference. And that is a word that begins with D. That's why I used it here. That, that means that you are going to respect your husband and you're going to defer to his judgment. Does he make every call right? No. But and, unless God has angels pastoring churches, we are going to make some imperfect calls sometimes. You just, it's so crucial that you respect your husband. He might not be getting any from anybody else in church. It might be great if his wife would treat him with respect, talk to him with respect, and, uh, you know, what's a pastor's wife? What's your first responsibility? Is it the pastor's part or the wife part? It's the wife part. And the Bible says, husbands, love your wives, and wives see that you respect your husbands. So you, you know what your first responsibility to do as a pastor's wife? Number one, first responsibility, respect your husband. Talk to him with respect have an attitude of respect toward him. You don't understand how crucial that is to his life. You don't understand how your words can uh, undermine his confidence more than anybody else's words. And so speak to him with respect. The third thing, and this is what I really want to address this morning, is this issue of devotion. Devotion. In this uh, in this Time Magazine article, <clears throat> it talked all about these web pages that pastor's wives can go on, you know. If you're feeling the stresses and strains, there's this web page, you know, pastorswives.com or something. I don't know what. <laughs> but thank God there is a greater refuge <laughs> than the Internet for you to go to in times of battle and struggle. 
See, it's very easy sometimes. You're, you're sent out of your mother church. You're away from your normal context. There are other challenges to your uh, structure of life and, uh, and friendships and reference points and all of these things. It's very easy to let that relationship with God slip. But you understand that ultimately it's not the pastor, it's not your husband, it, it, it's not the, the fellowship that is your ultimate refuge. No human being can be there to be what this psalm promises God will be to you, right? And this is the thing, that the, the pressure is that sometimes you expect your husband to be God for you. He's going to fix it. He's going to shield you. He's going to protect. He's going to answer these things. And he's a human being. There are things that he can do, and there's things that he just can't do. The glorious thing is that you serve a God who loves you, who cares about you, who, if you will make him your refuge, and you have to do that. Your, your husband... The pastor cannot make God a refuge for you. That is your responsibility, to build a relationship with God where he is your refuge. You know, uh, Ruth Graham just uh, passed away. This is Billy Graham's uh, wife, and, and I was reading an article about a man who had helped her uh, write some books over the years and the, the book that she, they were going to write next that she never got to was uh, How to Marry a Preacher and Remain a Christian. <laughs> and that's the thing. If you marry a, Chris, uh, marry a pastor, you have to remain a Christian. Right? You have to have a relationship with God. You have to make him your refuge. You have to find that place. You know, I went to school, graduated uh, from school with a young lady uh, who is the daughter of Jim and Betty Elliott. Jim Elliott was killed by the Alka Indians back in 1956. You know, she wrote a book about Jim Elliott's life with this passage in mind under the shadow of the Almighty. Well, I mean, how can you say that? He got killed. How, wh <laughs> where's the protection in that? See, there's, every one of us could come up, as, as Pastor Olson said yesterday, we all come up with some reason why some promise of God doesn't work because we heard somewhere and something happened to so and so can I tell you it's not our job just like Pastor Mitchell said with healing yesterday why not everybody gets healed we're not that's not our job to explain that our job is to proclaim what this says and I saw this young girl graduate from high school saw her go on to a great future married to a preacher saw this woman a woman of God to this day serving God and having a tremendous testimony and still being example an example to many many missionaries being sent all over you know what God took care of her at the moment when her husband is killed they've only been married like a, a handful of years uh, left with a two-year-old it's uh, hey God what have you done but God took care of her and whatever you're going through right now God will take care of you he, he is your refuge. He's your fortress. Right? He's the one in whom you can trust. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. And because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. Nobody can do that for you, right? Your husband can be a covering for you. He is, can be a shield for you in many things in life, and we're going to talk about that. But ultimately, your husband's not God. You cannot live just off of his relationship with God. 
I'm not telling you how many minutes a day you have to pray, how many minutes a day you need to read your Bible, and I, I you know, I, you need to get a woman's Bible, and you know, I don't, <laughs> I think just a regular Bible will do. <laughs> just tell you that, you know, pastoring is a glorious, glorious thing. It is the most awesome privilege to be able to do what we do, but it's not an easy thing, and it's fraught with certain difficulties. But God is, he's real, right? Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. God is alive, and God wants to be your refuge. It's, a, you know, if you'll permit me, I mean, he's there with his wings out for you to come under those wings. But you're, you've got your back to him and looking at all the problems and telling your husband what he should be doing it, and you're, you're losing it mentally. And what you need to do is just turn to get and get under those wings. Does that mean your feelings are never gonna get hurt? No. Does that mean that everything is gonna always turn out perfectly immediately? No. It does mean that that's the safest place in the world to be, in the will of God, under the shadow of the Almighty. But that's not automatic. This doesn't say that every believer experiences this. It says, when you make him your refuge. You have to make him your refuge. Nobody can do this for you. Your husband can't grab you and shove you under the wings of the Almighty. Right? <laughs> Here, stay under there. I'll come and get you later. <laughs> right? You, you have to come to that place where you'll come under his wings. I want to close with a thought of responding to need. I feel like it, I need to say this right now. You know, Jezebels don't hide behind this sermon. And say, yeah, I heard him say, but you know what? You, there is, a, that's a real issue. And I have dealt with the ferocity of that and, and uh, ladies that I've had to deal with over the years. And I, I, I know that's a very, very real thing. But you know, for every Jezebel, there's a number more of just wonderful, godly, <laughs> uh, wives that are just having trouble dealing with some of the pressures that come upon their lives because of the ministry. And so, you know what? If you're a church person, right? You're, I, I just have a, a challenge for you. We've, we've heard it say, you know, the best way to be a Pastor, first of all, if you'd be a Christian. Best way to be a pastor's wife is to be a Christian. Best way to be a disciple is to be a Christian. And the best way to be a Christian is to be a Christian. <laughs> and your love is the first fruit of the Spirit. Right? It's, it, it's the mark of authenticity of your Christianity. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. And, you know, 1 Corinthians 13 is a bunch of stuff about what love doesn't do, right? It isn't puffed up, doesn't behave itself unseemly, you know. Most of 1 Corinthians 13 is just cut it out, cut it out, cut it out. But one thing it does say, it says love is kind. That's one of the positives. Love is patient and love is kind. And if that's, if love is to be the first mark of your authentic experience as a believer in Jesus, you ought to be patient and you ought to be kind with your pastor's wife. Can you be nice to her? Church folks, can you just be nice to her? Don't talk about her. Don't talk to her in an unkind, critical way bringing to her all the pressures that you shouldn't even be worried about, never mind dumping on her. If you could just be kind. I know you think 
that if the pastor's wife would just do this and this and this, you could have revival. I want you to know the best thing your pastor's wife can do to have revival is to be a wife to her husband. See, some people struggle with being a pastor's wife because they struggle with being a wife. I don't know what I should do. I don't know what's my role, what's my responsibility, what I hear you. You know, I've, I've used this illustration before. It's not even in the notes, but I'm going to throw it in here. A little comic relief maybe or something. I don't know. But it, they, you know, remember when, you're, remember when you were having a baby? And your husband's there. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, okay, yeah, you're going to make it, honey. And uh, uh, here, eat some ice chips. And, uh, uh, you know, you're going to make it. And, uh, and you're, you did this to me. And, uh, you know, and, it's, uh, and, you know it's, it's going on. You know, he can be there. He can encourage you. But he can't have the baby for you. <laughs> when it comes down to it, you've got to do it. Let's reverse that with a church. You can't birth a church, ma'am. He's got to birth it. And so what would he do? You know, if you, <laughs> you were having your baby and your husband said, hey, what's taking you so long? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've been in this labor room for, a, you know. You know, the lady just down the hall, you know, she had her baby in 45 minutes. <laughs> you know you wouldn't be married right now. You'd be a <laughs> you'd be a widow, right? <laughs> he wouldn't make it out of that room alive. Okay, and so in the same way, you can't have that, but you can encourage him, right? You can speak to him. You can say it's going to be okay, honey. I believe in you, right? I believe in you. Church folk, can you maybe just accept? And I know this is a humbling thing to accept, that when you look at your pastor's wife, you don't get it. You don't know the pressures that are on. No, you don't. Well, I go through things too. I know you do. But you don't get it. And said, so, well, if I was a pastor, I would do this, and I would, would yeah, no, you don't get it. And so if you would just humble yourself and realize you don't get it, and how, what you would do and how she doesn't do enough, and you, she should do this, and if the church would have revival, if she, you're, you're greatly mistaken. Just, you know, 80% of pastor's wives feel unaccepted, and unappreciated. What they do do is not appreciated and who they are is so often criticized. And just give her a break. Love her. Encourage her. Right? Be there for her. You know, sometimes folks come back for redirection. It would be wonderful if wives of folks that came back to redirect you, you know something of the battles and struggles. If you could be a blessing, and so often it's, it happens the other way, you know, that your issues come out and assault the pastor's wife. I want to say something to the husbands. Again, uh, you know, uh, Pastor Torres so eloquently dealt with many of our responsibilities, but I just... You, you cannot be the ultimate shield and buckler of everything in life, but you must shield her from the things that are happening in the church and from the criticisms that are leveled against you. Don't tell her what you heard people are saying about you. Okay? <laughs> You're going to flip her right out. Okay? Shield her. Don't tell her about how the church finances are going down. 
you know, if she does the books for you, you just tell her what checks to write. You don't have to tell her what's left in the account. Don't let her, don't make her feel that pressure. The number one need that pastor's wives feel, this article said, is loneliness. Loneliness. Okay, they're away from their mother church and where their good friends are. They're away often from family. You know, depending on with the busyness of life, it's very difficult to get together with other pastor's wives and depending on what area. But you know what? Pastor, you can be a friend to her. You can take her on a date, right? And maybe you can't afford Ruth's Chris. We talk about going to McDonald's when we were in Alamogordo every Monday morning. Sit there with our egg McMuffins. <laughs> Look across the table and weep. <laughs> no, not all. So, I know there are so many challenges that are on you as a pastor. So many tugs and pulls, but you just have to know your wife needs you. Your wife needs that friendship. And if you'll, if you'll be there for her, then when she has to make the sacrifice decisions, when we, she has to release you, to do the things that you need to do. She, she knows that you're there for her. Yes, he's got to go, but he, when he comes back, he's going to be here. Yes, he's got to work. He's got to go counsel. He's got to study. But I know that when the books are closed, he's going to be there for me. Can she trust you that you have her best interest at heart? And finally, what, what God will do. Because remember, Man, you know, when you first responded, and I, and I don't know if there's a calling to be a pastor's wife, I'm, I'm, and I'm not really comfortable with that. Well, I'm called to be a pastor's wife and find a preacher that I can, <laughs> you know. Your husband's called, and you're called to go with him. That's two things. If he, when he goes, you've got to go with him. And when he stays, you've got to stay. But when, there was a time when you responded and you said, God, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything for you. And God heard those words. He's not just going to hold you to the commitment. He's, he's going to honor you for your obedience. He's going to honor you because you responded. Because ultimately, you're not serving. Ultimately, you're not serving your husband. You're not serving the church. You're not serving the fellowship. You're not serving... The number one being that you are is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is good for it. His word can be trusted. Our text says, because he, and can I put, and she, has set his love upon me. Set your love upon him. I will deliver him and set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. We want it, I'll make sure no trouble happens. No, it doesn't say that. It says he will be with you in trouble, and according to God, that's supposed to be sufficient. That's what the word of God said, that's supposed to be sufficient. I will deliver him and I will honor him. So you may be criticized. You, you are and you will be. Right, this, you, like it or not, you know men aren't the only sex with an ego. Women have egos too. And when the church isn't doing good and they have to show up to conference and they're not, they feel it. But can I tell you that if you'll just be faithful to be a support to your husband. Make God your refuge. He'll honor you. He'll make sure 
that you receive the honor and the reward that's, that's right. He will do right. You know, I've, I've watched over the years. I've been pastoring now, uh, be 28 years coming up this September. We've, we've been through some things. There's some things have happened, and, and my wife has been there with me th through it all. And she's taken a lot of hits. Do you know, uh, some time back, you, you know, you hear the criticisms and the suggestions. There's a woman in our church that, that wrote her a poem. And I'm just going to close with this. And let this, this is for you, pastor's wife. She's a godly woman. She has such grace, always a warm greeting, a smile on her face. She's always encouraging. She knows her place. She's the pastor's wife. She has to always look just right, always on time, though the schedule's tight. From early morning to late at night, always the pastor's wife. She's such a lady, everyone's friend. She serves with love from deep within. And all the rifts she tries to mend, oh, she's the pastor's wife. She carries your burdens. She prays for you. Sometimes she cries the whole night through. But she won't, but you won't know when she's feeling blue because she's the pastor's wife. At church, as she starts to walk up the aisle, so many need to stop and talk for a while. Though she's tired and she has her own trials, she's patient. She's the pastor's wife. Her life, her time is not her own. There's always a need. They go on and on. With a knock on the door, a ringing phone, that's the life of a pastor's wife. Her husband she shares with the whole congregation. She humbly accepts his intense dedication. In loneliness she kneels to seek consolation. God bless the pastor's wife. And she will someday reach the end of the race as she meets her master face to face. Surely our God has a special place in heaven for the pastor's wife. It was written by Rosie Sosueta. Amen. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes together. And while our heads are bowed and our eyes